So I want to start by saying how very honored I am to be here to present the 2018 Sankey Lecture at Brock University with the support of the Grand Lodge AF and AM of Canada in the province of Ontario. The Sankey Lecture Series is a model collaboration between the Masonic Fraternity and an academic institution. And I'm very pleased to be able to participate in a series which has presented such leading luminaries as Dr. Susan Summers, Dr. Joy Porter, Dr. Stephen Bullock, Dr. Andreas Ownerforce, and Dr. Jessica Harlan Jacobs, uh, members of a fraternity of scholars, which I'm very pleased to now be part of. What a wonderful opportunity this lecture series presents for Freemasons in and around St. Catherine and the academic community of Brock University. The organizers and patrons of this series are to be congratulated for their efforts and visions. I hope that all of you in the audience realize what a rare bird this lecture series is and what it represents um, for both the vision of Brock and the vision of the Grand Lodge. So thank you again for inviting me. So people who are unfamiliar with fraternal material culture frequently become overwhelmed when confronted with the mass of materials extant, emblazoned with esoteric symbols, fashioned by a multitude of organizations in a wide range of media, and created over almost the entire span of North American history. This feeling of bewilderment can be amplified by the fact that fraternal organizations commonly espouse an ideology of timelessness. The membership likes to believe that their brotherhoods are unchanging, stretching back, unvarying into the mists of antiquity. The Freemasons sometimes claim descent from the biblical builders of Solomon's Temple. The improved order of red men has been known to claim descent from the American patriots who secretly dressed as Indians to throw tea into the Boston Harbor as a rebellion against colonial British rule. These claims, which I will cautiously and cordially characterize as exaggerated at best, are attractive to the membership because at least part of the appeal of these fraternal groups are their image of constancy in a world racked by ever-increasing change. Claims of timelessness, however, can prove troublesome for connoisseurs, collectors, and scholars. And I want to uh, start here just by saying that I frequently tell my students that they should be aware of what a text is responding to. When a scholar is writing, when a scholar is speaking, why are they saying what they're saying? And I'm gonna give you the hint here that my talk today is in, is in part at least responding to the spat of recent publications about fraternal material culture um, there's uh, one published uh, a couple years ago by the University of Texas Press called As Above, So Below. There was a wonderful exhibition catalog published by the American Folk Art Museum two years ago called Mystery and Benevolence. Uh, there was uh, um, the Museum of Our National Heritage in Lexington, Massachusetts, almost 20 years ago, uh, published a wonderful um, scholarly book called the material culture of American Freemasons. And each of these is troubled by uh, this understanding of timelessness and trying to see these fraternal organizations as unchanging. That the ritual for, um, that takes place in which people are inculcated with the values of Freemasonry or the values of the Odd Fellows or the values of the Red Men um, the ritual keeps going year after year, century after century. And uh, as a historian, and as you all know, time changes things. There is nothing that's unchanging. There's nothing that's timeless. As humans, t we react to the world that's around us. So thus, what I hope to offer today is a framework to help to better understand fraternal objects by placing them within chronological, economic, and functional contexts. And in doing so, I also hope to be able to offer categories which will shed light upon transformations of how fraternal rituals have been practiced. So again, as I was introduced, you were told that I'm a scholar of American material culture. Um, and 
in many ways this is true, but I'm also a scholar of American history, and what I do is I bring objects into use as historical evidence, so that I'm always making historical arguments based upon objects, based upon buildings, based upon the material culture around us, the material world that we've created. So, but there's always a, a two-way street that as you, talk, as you use the objects to talk about history, you're changing the way you think about history, but also by placing objects into their historical context, it helps you to understand the objects as well. So my argument here today, my talk today has two pieces. One is to help you to understand the objects a little bit better, but the other piece is to use the objects to help us to understand fraternal history a little bit better and to under use the objects as evidence of changing ritual practices and thus also changing ideology and usage within the fraternity. Is that as clear as mud? Have I had? Okay. So, I've chosen today to focus upon ritual practices because the act of initiating individuals into the organization is at the very center of fraternal life. You know, fraternalism has a lot of other things going on. Lots of people like to talk about charities. Lots of people like to talk about fellowship. But it's the initiation which defines the fraternal membership. And the inculcation of identities and ideologies through ritual defines North American fraternalism. However, rituals and how they are practiced, like every other human activity, changes over time. And while ritual can remain central to fraternal identity, how that ritual is practiced and how it's understood shifts in relation to transformations in the organization's context. So again, here we're going back and forth between the subject and the context, right? Is the subject the fraternal organization or is the context industrialization and changes in theater practice or is, are we looking at the larger context and then coming back to the organization. So what I'm hoping to proffer to you today is a way that may be useful to think of fraternal ritual as being divided into three historically situated modes. All right, so this is what historians call periodization. I'm gonna offer you three periods of fraternal ritual and hopefully when you come out of here, Again, in academics, we're always talking about learning outcomes. What is it you want the students to learn, all right? So the learning outcome, write this in your notes, the learning outcome for today's lecture is that there are three basic categories of, of fraternal ritual that you can place things into. So as you can see from the screen and from the title of my talk, these three modes are catechism, spectacle, and burlesque. And the intellectual and chronological edges of these paradigms are blurry. You know, where, when do you go from catechism to, to, uh, to spectacle? Well, uh, I think it's about 1830, but there are certainly some people that are starting to do, are moving towards spectacle before that, and there are certainly people that continue to do catechism after that. And then the transition from spectacle to burlesque they're both going on at the same time. So even though I've just undercut my argument by saying that you've got blurry I issues between the paradigms, I, I think that they do designate distinct patterns embodied in fraternal material culture. All right, so here again, if you just look at the ritual books, if you just look at the monitors, if you just look at the uh, the anti-Masonic ritual transcripts, if you just look at the printed documents, you're not going to see this transformation. This transformation in ritual practice only shows up fully by looking at the objects and the, and the um, environments in which the, the ritual is taking place. So, and, and, I, and so, again, not to make too much of an argument for myself, but this is where my contribution is, is that I'm looking at objects to get a fuller understanding of fraternal history rather than uh, some of my more traditional historical friends who rely solely on the written record, right? So I'm trying to say if you look at the upper world around you, if you look at the objects that, you're, that the fraternal organizations are using, you get a fuller understanding of what they're doing. All right, so back to my three categories. 
catechism describes the largely oral communication of esoteric ideas which took place in the first century of American fraternalism from the establishment of the first Masonic lodges west of the Atlantic Ocean, which takes place in the 1730s, until the anti-Masonic period of the 1820s. All right, so that's catechism. By spectacle, I mean the increasingly theatrical, visual, and material presentation of fraternalism, which coincides with industrial expansion and concomitant prosperity in the century between 1830 and 1933, right? So this is this century of 1830 to 1933. This is the period of the Industrial Revolution, right? Which, which I always think that's a, a bad term because it makes it sound like it happened overnight, a revolution, right? But the Industrial Revolution, right? Where, where do we start it? 1790 with Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or do we start it uh, later than that with, uh, some people would say it was Henry Ford in the 1920s, right? But sometime in this century, the world transformed and people had more money, more things. And because of that more money, more things, fraternalism changes also. And finally, the third catalog by Burlesque, I refer not to women, artfully removing garments, right? That's usually what we think of by burlesque, right? That's not what we're talking about. But in this case, and this is a term that comes out of the, out of the uh, primary documents itself, burlesque here means behavior which parodied or commented upon earlier fraternal forms, right? So burlesque is parodies of fraternalism. So, and then people will ask you, why 1933? Well. Partly, I like the, uh, the, the neatness of 1733, the first lodge, to 1933, 200 years later. But also, by 1933, the traumas and transformations of the global depression, which starts to set in 1927, 1928, when do we say that the, the Great Depression happened? A lot of people like to say, well, the stock market fell in 1929, that's when it is. But if you look at the larger pattern, the world's already in depression before that, and that the falling stock market is a result rather than a cause of the depression. So with the global depression of the 1930s and then the World War which followed it, radic this radically shifted society such that North Americans never subsequently embraced fraternalism as they had previously. So this isn't to say that fraternalism went away, it just means that there's a fourth period which is the period from 1933 to the present. And I was lying awake at late last night in my hotel room thinking, oh my God, they're gonna ask me about that fourth period. And I don't really have an answer for you, all right? So that's another lecture. You'll have to ask me back to talk about the, the 20th century. Um, all right, so catechism, 1733 to 1831, spectacle, 1830 to 1933, and burlesque, about 1890 to about 1933. Now, because of the limited time that we have today, I have restricted my uh, an analysis to organizations composed of white men. And I know this is problematic, but you know, I don't have 24 hours to talk to you. I, can only, I only have about an hour, right? So fraternalism was so pervasive as a resource in the past that all segments of society, including women, including children, including minorities, participated. And this is the exciting uh, role of fraternal studies right now, is that scholars are currently doing exciting new work about the role that initiatory organizations have played in promoting African American agency and also in shaping female gender identity. So the first generation of scholars looking at fraternalism, again, they were picking the low-hanging fruit. The largest organizations were white men, and that's who most of the scholars worked on. Now we're into maybe a second generation of scholars, and there's more and more people working on how fraternalism manifested itself in other segments of the population. And while these are important, they're not my topic today. And because American society was structured to privilege white males, you know, again, uh, North American society, you can't, um, you can't not recognize 
the privileged position that white males had in society, the organizations composed of this demographic were the wealthiest, the most influential, and also left behind the most material evidence. So consequently, these groups are the focus of today's talk because they left the richest material heritage. And similarly, Freemasonry will loom large in my talk today because it was the earliest, the strongest, and the most influential of the fraternal brotherhoods. So this is just my kind of academic throat clearing and caveat that, you know, just because what I'm talking about is about white men, don't think that that's the whole story. This is just the part of the story that's the easiest to tell and where we're starting by telling the story. And I want to call your attention in particular to this uh, amazing um, uh, painting by David Bustle Bowser, this banner from about 1870. Um, David Bustle Bowser is one of my heroes. He was uh, um, a member of a free African-American family in Philadelphia before the Civil War. Uh, he, be, he trained himself as a painter. He was active as an abolitionist. So every time you, every time you see an abolitionist, um, uh, a story about abolitionism or an abolitionist poster from the uh, antebellum period, David Bustle Bowser's name is on there. Um, he uh, painted the regimental flags for the African-American regiments that came out of uh, Philadelphia during the Civil War. Um, and after the war, he became the Grand Secretary of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, which was the African-American Odd Fellows, just like you have the Prince Hall Freemasons. Um, so, and this is a banner that he made um, for the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows as well as being Grand Secretary, and again, it was a national organization rather than a, um, an or, a, a statewide or territorial, so he was responsible for the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows in all of North America. And on the, the side of that, he was also, as a painter, making and selling regalia and props for the organization. So this is a, a Grand United Order of Odd Fellows banner that he made, that he painted. And the thing that I think that's fantastic about this is you'll notice that the emblematic female figures are not Anglo-American. He's got African-American women playing the role of faith, hope, and charity. So there's something about, gen about gender, there's something about race in this banner made by and for African-American odd fellows in 1870. Now, in the period right after the Civil War, he went and chartered new lodges all throughout the American South as African-Americans were coming out of slavery, as they were building a society for themselves. And I know that he was painting banners like this in Alabama, in Georgia, in North Carolina, but I just haven't been able to find any of them. So this is one of the excitement of doing this work, is that there's always new material coming to the surface to do research about this material. All right, I'm sorry for that aside, but I just had to tell you about this painting. Um, so, Coming back to the main theme, we're now going to start to talk about catechism. And again, mostly today we're going to be talking about Freemasonry um, with other uh, organizations thrown in. So Freemasonry arrived in North American, in the North American British colonies in the early 18th century as part of what would become the global expansion of an English gentleman's club, which had taken shape at the end of the 17th century. Men of leisure influenced by esoteric ideas, including Rosicrucianism and Neoplatonism, had joined stonemasons' guilds, thus transforming these working men's clubs into ethical and philosophical societies, which used architectural metaphors to teach enlightenment ideas concerning nature and society. Upon joining the organization, new members took on the symbolic identity of a builder by undergoing a stylized guild initiation and learning the meanings and intellectual uses of construction tools. So on the right of this slide, you see an image published in Paris in 1744 illustrating a Masonic Lodge receiving a new member, right? And this is an image that if you're doing Masonic studies, you'll see it over and over again. Uh, it's too bad we... Um, don't have uh, such a good image from London, 
you know, that this is a French example. Uh, and the master of the lodge sits on the right wearing a tricorn hat while the new member is on the left in a blindfold. So once the blindfold is removed, the entered apprentice will receive a lecture in which the organization's ideologies will be explained using the images on the painted design which lies on the floor between the presiding officer and the initiate. The officers of the lodge have memorized the speech which they are present to present to the candidate, and before he progressed through the organization, the novice had to demonstrate that he could also recite a catechism. So although abstract concepts were represented visually on the painting on the floor, and before the painting on the floor, the lodge member, before they started to use paintings on the floor, lodge members would often um, sketch these images in chalk, right? So this is a, a technological um, improvement, right? Moving from chalk to the visual uh, painting. Although these abstract concepts were represented visually, the idea that the teachings of the lodge were conveyed orally, or from mouth to ear, as the members said, was central to the organization, right? So it's the verbal mouth to ear communication that is central to this initiation. Even when there are visual um, aids being used, now on the left in this slide is one of the earliest extant Masonic visual aids in North America. Um, and again, I've spent a lot of time and looking for these and this is about the earliest one. And it belongs to Royal White Hart Lodge number two of Halifax, North Carolina. <clears throat> and again, at the very beginning, these lodges were all just on the coastline. All the lodges were within 10 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. And Halifax is um, there on the coast, just south of the Virginia border. Um, now, this one may very well have been purchased in London and brought across the Atlantic by Joseph Monfort, a member of the lodge who was prominent in North Carolina's colonial government. Again, at this time, Freemasonry was about empire, was about people in the colonies being in contact with people in London. So Monfort was going back and forth, and we, uh, the best scholarship on this is that he, it's probably an English painting that was brought over to be used in North Carolina as a way of Monfort uh, supporting Freemasonry, but also as being a patron of this lodge and thus building up his status in North Carolina and showing that he is the patron of the lodge. And you can see that this painting closely resembles the prop being used by the French Lodge in the engraving. They both have columns representing the pillars on the porch of Solomon's Temple, as well as steps, and also a checkerboard pavement. The N, E, S, and W in the North Carolina painting indicate how the cloth is meant to be situated on the floor, with the E positioned closest to the masters. Uh, closest to the master or the master's station. So when used in this way, these paintings are referred to as Masonic floor cloths or master's carpets. And again, that idea of the carpet being on the floor of the lodge. Now over time, ritual use had changed so that the emblematic paintings moved from being used horizontally on the floor to being hung vertically on the wall. And those that were made to be displayed vertically came to be called tracing boards. Again, kind of using that architectural metaphor that this is supposed to be like a blueprint, a blueprint of Solomon's temple, a blueprint of the character of the man that's being made a mason. And in the 18th century, these works continued to be rolled up so that they could easily be stowed away and transported, since during this time, lodges were relatively informal organizations that met in members' homes or in taverns or in car coffee houses, once again, largely in port cities along the eastern seaboard. So these were, I, I tell my students, this is the 18th century uh, equivalent of a PowerPoint. Right? That this is a visual aid that when you need to give the lecture, you pull it out and put it up and that way you can point at it. So this example, and again, these are, you know, just like the PowerPoint is only temporarily on the wall in this space, this is not a space that's given, that's distinctly set up for the Sankey lecture. 
right? This visual aid was used in a space that was not set up for Masonic uh, usage, right? It was a tavern or a coffee house, and then when the ritual was happening, this came out. And this example, I love this one, was made to illustrate the second degree. So it's a particular degree. Each of the three degrees would have, in this case, um, its own tracing board. This was made to illustrate the second degree. It's currently owned by the Grand Lodge of Nova Scotia, but it has a provenance which takes it back to a lodge in New York City that when the, revolution, when the American Revolution took place, the members of this New York City Lodge were loyalists and they all left for Nova Scotia and they weren't gonna leave their stuff behind for the Patriots to use, so they took their ritual paintings with them. So this is a New York City tracing board which then goes to Nova Scotia and is used in this lodge in Nova Scotia. During the final decades of the colonial period and the first years of the early republic in the United States, Freemasonry blossomed as artisans and other merchants sought to establish themselves as individuals worthy of respect. So this is a time period when the social standing of Masonic members comes down a, a little notch. Rather than being the very elite of colonial society, they become kind of more middle class, right? And you end up having people like Paul Revere, who is a craftsman, or Thomas Jefferson, who was a printer, become Masons, as opposed to being Joseph Montfort, who's a landowner and an aristocrat. So whereas in initially lodges were only located in coastal cities, in the years following the American Revolution, the fraternity spread west into the interior. And rather than being a plaything of the international elite, Freemasonry became an institution of middle class respectability and local lodges became less ephemeral and more stable. And as their treasuries allowed, lodges commissioned signed painters and other artists to produce tracing boards for them. And these works were influenced by engravings and, and book illustrations, but they're frequently unsigned and can have unclear provenance. Um, and these two examples, and I'm going to brag a little bit, these are um, paint tracing boards which when I worked for the Grand Lodge of New York, I found them in um, lodge rooms in the middle of New York State, and the members had no idea that these were rare early 19th century paintings. They were just something that had been hanging in the lodge room um, all along, you know, and they hadn't ever thought critically about them. So the one on the left, which I found in Bridgewater, uh, New York, got my attention. And I said, I bet there's more out there. And so the next month, I made an appointment to go and give a talk in the lodge in Cherry Valley, because it seemed like Cherry Valley might have one. And sure enough, this one on the right was, was in the lodge room in Cherry Valley. And I got both of them to be donated to the Grand Lodge of New York. So they're now in the Livingston Masonic Library. And you can see that they're obviously by the same artist, right? Even though they're quite, they're, 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 they're slightly different, but the hand is obviously the same. And, and here's a piece of the scholarship that if there are young scholars that are interested in this thing, in this, there's still work to be done about how exactly did the painters decide how the, the tracing board was going to look from one lodge to the next. You know, was, did the master tell him what he wanted? Was the commission simply given to the painter and the lodge gave over authority to the ritual work to the, to the illustrator? I can't believe that's true. But even when they're based on engravings, and you can find engravings that are similar to them, even when they're based on engravings, they're never quite perfect. So this is the exciting thing about Freemasonry in this period, is that in the federal period in 1800 to 1820, the ritual had not yet fully been codified and the Grand Lodge did not have control over how the ritual was being performed. Right, so that each lodge could have their own tracing board and they could, and again, because it was being um, uh, done mouth to ear, each time it was done, it might be a little bit different. So this shows at this point that the Freemasonry was a living, vital, oral tradition that had not yet been codified by Enlightenment thinking in the 19th century. So, even though these are both meant to be used for all of the first three degrees of masonry, note that all, they're similar, but the painter has arranged the symbols slightly differently. 
Now, in a recent article in the Journal for Research into Freemasonry and Fraternalism, Forrest D. Pass of the City of Ottawa Museums has shed greater light on a Masonic tracing board in the collection of Library and Archives Canada. And this work, which Pass documents as being purchased in 1818, belonged to Rideau Lodge Number no. 25, which met in Burt's Rapids. And Burt's Rapids is not very far from here, is that right? Um, so the lodge minutes indicate that this tracing board was purchased for 15 pounds and that an additional two pounds was paid to a brother to frame it. So again, that framing is important because that indicates that it's not going to be rolled up, right? That once they frame it, it's kind of stable. It means that the lodge has a stable meeting place. They're not going to uh, go to a different tavern. They're not going to be meeting in somebody's home. And Rideau Lodge was largely composed of sons of loyalist refugees and other immigrants from New York and New England. And while loyal to the crown, they also had significant cultural and social ties to the United States and imported many of the goods that they were using. And again, Forest Pass has their record book, so he's able to see exactly where the different things are that they're purchasing are coming from. And he also is able to use census records to realize that many of the members of Rideau Lodge had been made masons on the other side of the American border. So again, this idea, here we've got another example of Freemasonry being an international organization, that it doesn't matter if you're made a mason in the United States or if you're made a mason in Canada. Um, it, it's an international brotherhood. And Pass argues that this tracing board was probably also purchased south of the border and brought north. <clears throat> so Redoubt uh, Lodge adjourned in 1826 in the midst of the American anti-Masonic fervor. It reorganized briefly in 1840 and then went permanently dark in 1846. So again, this lodge was firmly embedded in that first catechism period. And the extinction of this lodge represents, in part, the ephemeral quality of communities in the economy of the early 19th century. Many of the residents of Burt's Rapids moved to the adjacent towns of Kempville and Merrickville as those communities prospered, and the older hamlet dissipated. And by, by 1846, there were not enough um, uh, people in the town to continue to support a Masonic lodge. So this spectacular Rococo Masonic chair, which displays many of the same Im images as the tracing boards, may also have been designed to assist as a visual aid for the Masonic lectures. And it was made by the noted cabinet maker Benjamin Bucktrout in 1770 in Williamsburg, Virginia, another coastal settlement. F. Carey Howlett, one of the curators at Williamsburg, has indicated that the design of the chair relates to the frontispiece of Thomas and Batty Langley's The Builder's Jewel, published in London, which also inspired tracing boards. So I think probably this uh, Williamsburg Lodge did not have a tracing board. They just used this piece of furniture as visual aid for the, for the lectures. And the chair, which was deposited in Edenton, North Carolina in 1778, may, like the paintings from New York, have been removed from its original home due to the turbulence of the revolution, right? That it was moved to a place of safety while the revolution was going on in Williamsburg. Now, although lodges had become more stable and institutionalized in the first decades of the 19th century, they continued to meet in casual spaces. Few lodges had rooms designated solely and specifically for their use. However, notable examples do exist in which rooms within homes or taverns have received special ornamentation to better fit them for Masonic use. So the Ta Salem Townhouse, built in Charlton, Massachusetts, in 1796, for example, has murals depicting the, the cedars of Lebanon and an all-seeing eye and a constellation of stars on the ceiling of a large room on the second floor. And so this is a private house. It's a private house owned by a guy named Salem Town. So it's kind of confusing because it sounds like it's a, but it's, a, it's Salem Town's house. And he was a wealthy, um, 
a member of the community and the lodge met in the second floor of his house. So they, des they decorated this room to, uh, for that purpose. Noteworthy Masonic murals from this period also survive in the Alicia Gilbert House in New Lebanon, Columbia County, New York, and Margaret Gehring of the Department of Art at New Mexico State University has recently done significant work on the murals you see here. She suggests that they were painted by an itinerant artist named Daniel Barling, probably in the period between 1796 and 1818. As a rule, however, during this time, fraternal rituals were conveyed orally using visual aids in multi-use spaces that were hired or borrowed for fraternal purposes. So again, you've got these uh, murals on the wall, but again, the murals are kind of an extension of the tracing boards rather than being, um, rather than being uh, what we'll see coming up later on. And during this early period, conviviality played an important role in the life of the fraternity, and members regular, regularly consumed both wines and alcoholic punches at their gatherings. So punch bowls, decanters, glasses, and pitchers were frequently ornamented with Masonic emblems, thus recognizing the importance of imbibing to the life of the Brotherhood. So mostly, I'm talking about the initiation ritual, but here I'm kind of hinting that in this early period, drinking was a ritual in itself, right? That you did the fraternal ritual and then you went to refreshment and imbibing and drinking alcohol was kind of a ritual undertaking as well. Now the anti-Masonic movement brought this period to a stuttering halt in the late 1820s and early 1830s. Many Americans enthusiastic for the egalitarianism of the Jacksonian era and inspired by the evangelicalism of the Second Great Awakening came to distrust Freemasonry and fraternalism more generally as a haven for elites conspiring to cheat them out of their rights and as a stronghold of sinning free thinkers and rationalistic deists. Right? And these, these arguments are the, the basis of much anti-masonry anti, uh, all the way into the present, right? This idea of sinning free thinkers and rationalistic deists and elites working to control the world. So anti-masons condemned the fraternity as both subverting justice and also in this period of evangelical fervor, delaying Christ's second appearance, right? The, Christ was not going to come back until the world had been perfected, and Freemasons are one of the flaws that were stopping Jesus from ar arriving out of the clouds. So unable to withstand public pressure, many Freemasons gave up their fraternal membership, and all across the nation and all up into Canada, I understand as well, lodges went out of existence. Now, this anti-Masonic pamphlet, published in Utica, New York, so just 10 miles away from where those tracing boards that I found were, were being used, right? So again, there's a, a, a geographic con uh, uh, connection between these. Um, also buttresses our understanding of fraternal spaces, even as it is a piece of anti-Masonic propaganda. So again, uh, look at these roguish fraternalists with their poor roped and blindfolded candidate who's about to be hit on the head with a mallet, right? So uh, they're, they're, they're trying to make the Masonic ritual look ridiculous, but they're also conducting their dire ceremonies in a space which is remarkable only for its rustic exposed beams, cracked plaster, and mice skittering along the walls, right? So the, uh, the anti-Masons are not you know, even though they're condemning the Masons for being elitist, they're not showing the Masons doing their ritual in palaces, right? They are close enough to reality that they're showing that this ritual is taking place in a space that's basically just a normal space, all just an attic, right? And this attic does not look all that different, you know, with the arched roof and the windows. It doesn't look all that different from our Salem townhouse, you know, it's just, you know, there's, there's certainly an editorial slant going on, but it's, we're just talking about the same kinds of spaces. So while anti-masonry decimated the dominant brotherhood, 
It created opportunity for other fraternal organizations to prosper, including the Sons of Temperance, the Washingtonians, and most notably the Odd Fellows, another organization which had expanded to the United States from Great Britain. And critics such as E. Willis, the publisher of this compelling lithograph from 1847, censured the Odd Fellows for the secrecy of their proceedings, but with little efficacy. As Masonic scholar and curator Mark Tabert has noted, throughout the 1840s, membership in the Odd Fellows expanded. So a lot of what happened with the anti-Mason period is that the people were driven out of Freemasonry and the same guys just went across the street and joined the Odd Fellows. And they continued to do the same kinds of rituals, but the Odd Fellows were not the same lightning rod that the Masons had been. So during these years, the United States had also begun to experience the benefits of the market, transportation, and industrial revolutions. Americans were becoming better off, and the availability of material goods was expanding. So fraternal rituals began to take place with a wider variety of supporting objects within customized rooms. So note that in this image, the fraternalists not only wear aprons, but also have crowns, robes, masks, spears, baldachins, a coffin, and a skeleton. So these props continue, contributed to a greater emotional impact to the performance of the ritual. All right, so here we are at the, the boundary between you know, the guys up in the attic that I just showed you. These guys are still doing catechism. Right? And here by 1847, 1846, even though this is an anti-Odd Fellows um, piece of propaganda, it's still showing a different lodge room. Right? It's showing a lodge room that looks more familiar to many fraternalists' eyes. Now following the Civil War, the evangelicalism and, anti and egalitarianism egalitarianism of the antebellum period was replaced by the income inequality and materialism of the Gilded Age made possible by water and steam powered manufacturing, railroad transportation, immigrant labor, and resource extraction from the West. As Masonic lodges were rechartered and as Oddfellows lodges prospered, they had the resources to create sanctified apartments specially furnished for their mystic rites. So with added space, ritualists placed a new emphasis upon what they called floor work, meaning dramatic action. Fraternalists also frequently embraced the period's middle class Protestant American obsession with temperance, and alcohol played a smaller role in the Brotherhood's activities than it had previously. So in this period of spectacle, you no longer see punch bowls, you no longer see decanters, more frequently you see coffee cups. Right, because Masons were no longer allowed to be drinking as part of their undertaking because society had changed around them. So on the left side of the screen here, you see the newly completed lodge room in the grand Second Empire style Masonic temple that the Grand Lodge of New York built between 1870 and 1875 at the corner of 6th Avenue and 23rd Street. And you'll see that it contains a matched set of gleaming veneered furniture enhanced with elaborately tufted luxurious upholstery. And again, think about the difference between this room with its carpeting and, and chandeliers and, and uh, upholstered furniture as opposed to the attic that we just showed you. Um, ritual manuals published during this time of Freemasonry's reascendancy provided greater emphasis upon the physical and emotional activities of initiation, including the symbolic death and rebirth of Hiram Abiff, the architect of Solomon's temple, and the pledging of solemn vows of brotherhood upon an illuminated altar. The content of the rituals may not have changed, but the manner in which the lessons were conveyed had. So no longer was it about mouth to ear, now it was about enacting and taking the place of Hiram Abiff and playing the role of King Solomon and having a theatrical and an emotional um, linkage to the characters in the story. In Marshall McLuhan's famous words, the medium is the message. And as an aside, note that in both of these images, the lodge officers conducting the floor work have donned Masonic aprons layered upon traditional male garments. So these are images, engravings from 
the, again, about the same time that the building is built, about 1870, 1875. So they're enacting the ritual, but they're still doing it in business wear with the regalia on top of it. Now, as fraternalists redefined their ritual spaces, they also entered a new marketplace for brotherhood. The Freemasons were no longer the only game in town, and the Odd Fellows had to contend with upstarts, including the ancient order of United Workmen, the Knights of Pythias, the Knights of the Maccabees, the Knights of Honor, the improved order of Red Men. And many of these organizations offered insurance benefits, but sociologist Marianne Clausen has argued that fraternalism in this time period of the late 19th century was essentially an entertainment industry. Rituals were theater, and to compete for an audience, lodges had to provide compelling environments. They had to provide a reason to leave the house and why to join the Masons rather than joining the Knights of Maccabees. So beyond being comfortable and luxuriant, lodge rooms became ornate with elaborate decorations and exotic murals. And certainly the wealthiest organizations in the largest cities created the most spectacular rooms. Philadelphia's Masonic Temple, with multiple ritual rooms adorned by the renowned interior decorator George Herzog in 1889, is arguably the pinnacle of this movement. And if you're interested in Masonic history, you really need to go see the Philadelphia Masonic Temple. It is worth the trip. And this is the uh, Egyptian room from that temple. However, many fraternal groups could afford a local muralist to improve the walls and stencil the ceiling. So this is the Odd Fellows Lodge in Haverhill, Massachusetts, photographed in about 1870 by A.W. Anderson with its emblematic machine woven carpet and its pictorial walls. And this is a lodge room in a manufacturing town in northern Massachusetts. So it's not a, a center of wealth. And yet, the fraternity has this wonder, I mean, the Odd Fellows have this wonderful, rich space that is competing with the parlor at home for a man to spend his time in it in the, in the evening. And you can see what the residents of a manufacturing community could hope to achieve. So with fraternal membership expanding while the price of goods was declining during what economic historians have called the great deflation, Fraternal organizations decided to stop renting rooms above banks and theaters, and they built buildings to convey their strength and prowess. They erected in the 1860s and 1870s uh, buildings like the Boston Masonic Temple, designed by Merrill G. Wheelock, um, and Joseph Billings Oddfellows Hall, completed in 1872. And these metropolitan buildings set a high standard. Yet over the next five and six decades, groups across the nation built increasingly larger structures because they kept outgrowing. Fraternalism was booming, the business was good, and they kept outgrowing the buildings that they were building, so they kept building even larger ones until this culminated, this race uh, culminated with the Detroit Masonic Temple, which was underway when the Great Depression struck and is unfinished to this day. And the Detroit Masonic Temple is the biggest Masonic Temple ever built in the world. Now, although 19th century halls, such as those on the screen, usually had commercial rental space on, the, on at least the first floor, around 1900, many groups decided that this rental income was superfluous. They had enough money coming in from dues that they didn't need rental income. And they built structures that they called pure Masonic temples that only had fraternal spaces in it. And as you can predict, when the economic crash came in 1929, this was de devastating. And many of these grand buildings were turned over to creditors when fraternalists could no longer pay their mortgages. Now, with an increased emphasis upon dramatic action and rituals taking place within lodge rooms painted to represent locales distant in both time and space, at the end of the 19th century, fraternalists became uncomfortable conducting their ritual in business attire. It just didn't seem right for a king or a knight or an Indian chief to wear a suit coat. You know, if you're going to be King Solomon, you should be wearing robes, right? So, we, and so here's a commentator writing in 1894. 
we believe that the use of robes not only intensifies the realistic part of the degree, but is more in keeping with the period which is intended to be portrayed than to appear in the abominable, unromantic dress of modern civilization, more times with a dirty collar, unblackened boots, and trousers nearly to the ankle than any other way. All right, so again, they're saying, oh, our membership can't be trusted to dress appropriately, but if you give them robes, you know, they'll, they'll bring it across. So through the economic magic of supply and demand, an entire industry developed to provide crowns, gowns, robes, sandals, swords, breastplates, wigs, and any other accessory which a fraternalist might desire. The largest firms, including M.C. Lilly and Company, Ward Stilson, and Henderson Ames and Company had factories located in the Midwest, but they employed salesmen in the largest cities, they advertised extensively in the fraternal press, and they did a lot of their business through mail order. Now, if we believe Marianne Clausen that fraternalism was an entertainment industry, then inevitably American fraternalists sought to perform their rituals with scenery. Halls built by the patrons of husbandry, otherwise known as the Grange, frequently were built with stages that featured scenery, as you see in this example from New Hampshire. And Dr. Wendy Wasnett Barrett, who you might think about inviting at some point, has done a wonderful job working on uh, Scottish Rite scenery and has also identified Sokol Halls in the upper Midwest as another important repository of fraternal scenery. The so-called was an organization of Czech immigrants who used their scenery to affirm attachment to the Czech homeland, even while in the United States. And scenic design studios, including Toomey and Volland, Great Western, and Sauston and Landis, were obviously pleased to find an expanded alternative market for their product outside the professional theater. So while other societies purchased scenery, the fraternal spectacle was developed to its fullest by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, possibly because of the thematic complexity of its 32 degrees. Starting in the 1890s, Scottish Rite organizations incorporated backdrops into their meeting spaces, and using scenery by pulling ropes and changing drops, Scottish Rite Masons were able to transform their space in uh, uh, an industrial city into the throne room of a Persian king, a mountaintop, a military encampment, a cathedral, a rustic cave, or even Hades. Instead of initiating a single individual at a time, the Scottish Rite welcomed large classes of members who learned the organization's mystic teachings, teachings by watching dramatic reenactments on a stage. Hefty classes, of course, meant hefty fees, which in turn allowed bigger and better buildings. Rather than remaining in lodge rooms, the Scottish Rite began to build auditoriums, such as that in the 1915 Scottish Rite Cathedral in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which you see on the left here, which were outfitted with modern theatrical lighting and extensive sets of dramatic drops. And again, when I came into this room, I said, oh, this feels very much like a Scottish Rite Cathedral. It's got the same floor plan. And on the right is a photograph of one set of theatrical drops in the Scottish Rite Temple in Duluth, Minnesota, by the firm of Sossman and Landis. Um, in 1924, the Scottish Rite Masons of St. Louis, Missouri dedicated a new building in a restrained modern classicism by William Itner. An auditorium seating 3,000 is the building's largest outstanding feature with a wide proscenium arch uninterrupted by a single pole or pillar. Upon its completion, a thousand men simultaneously paid for and underwent the conferral of the fourth through the 32nd degree a class of a thousand men when this building was dedicated. And within five years, the building was paid off, right? So when you're doing classes that large with membership fees that large, you know, before you know it, the building is, is paid for. So fraternal ritual had transformed significantly since the members of Royal White Hart Lodge Number no. 2 of Halifax, North Carolina, laid their cloth out on the floor and lectured a single novitiate on the meaning of the figures inscribed on it. Yet even with the novel presentation technology, the audience members in St. Louis still largely believed that they were learning important truths about reality, about themselves, and about their relationship with the ineffable. They were serious about their endeavor, about the fraternal ritual. 
But at the same time, an alternate strain of fraternalism had developed, which burlesqued or mocked fraternal pieties and reverences. Fraternalism had become so commonplace within American society that its forms could be turned on its head. A new modern temper had developed which could find great humor in asking a friend to kneel at an altar so that a mechanical skeleton could spring out of the box and spray water into his face. Of course, this joke depended upon the poor sap thinking that kneeling to take an oath was a normal expected behavior, right? If he wasn't expecting to kneel at the, at the altar, you couldn't get him right for the skeleton. So this third strand of fraternalism, which begins just before the advent of the 20th century, represents a rejection of the staid respectability of the Victorians. Rather, it embodies an embrace of a new identity based upon personality rather than upon character. So since the middle of the 19th century, American culture has included a trope which claims that riding a goat comprised an element of fraternal initiation. And I've wrote about this elsewhere. I'd be happy to give you the citation to the article. Um, so this idea was introduced or originally by critics of the fraternal organization to decry their love of secrecy and to question what activities took place behind closed doors. So the image on the left from 1857, for example, depicts a poor candidate who has been duped into sacrificing his dignity. By the end of the century, however, many secret society members had embraced the image of goat riding as an insider's joke, as a way to torment the credulous. So this image of fraternal dogs in a lodge room from about 1900 is by the artist Cassius Marcellus Coolidge, who made a career out of calendar illustrations of canines pursuing the pastimes of middle class masculinity. His most famous paintings are of dogs playing poker. Right? But here it's dogs uh, riding the goat. So in the 1890s, fraternalists combined this long-standing joke with the new taste for burlesque initiations and began to manufacture and use mechanical goats. This example has a provenance linking it to an odd fellow's lodge in western Pennsylvania. And when in 1894 the modern woodmen of America added a new degree with a goat to their rituals. According to their official history, the, offer, the order experienced, quote, an immediate increase in interest in the work of the camps and a corresponding impetus to growth resulted. So by adding the mechanical goat, they got more members. Men enjoyed seeing their fellows subjected to the indignities of burlesque initiation. A promotional writer for Louis E. Stilson, bro uh, brother of Phil Philadelphia, a manufacturer of mechanical goats explained, quote, after he rides it once, he wants to have the fun of seeing some other fellow ride it, end quote. Now, although most lodge goats were apparently created commercially by fraternal supply companies, collectors have pulled a number of homemade fraternal goats out of lodge halls. Here's more treasures out there to look for. Can you find homemade folk art go goats like these? So this goat model, marketed by the DeMoulin Brothers and Company of Greenville, Illinois, allowed the candidate to be strapped in and turned upon his head. You will also note that it was available not just with a goat, but with a horse, a mule, or a camel body instead of the goat. And possibly my favorite detail, and it's in the fine print down at the bottom, says it comes with a ba attachment, which makes the goat more goaty. <laughs> now, after a number of potential members were injured, in, 19, <laughs> in 1915, the modern woodman forbade further use of this Ferris wheel goat. Now, although the lodge goat was probably the most common form of burlesque initiation device, early 20th century manufacturers and customers were limited only by their imagination. They also took full advantage of America's developing engineering prowess and created devices that utilized springs, hydraulics, and even developing electrical technology. The DeMoulin Brothers' primary competitor in this field was the Pettibone Brothers Manufacturing Company of Cincinnati. And here are two examples from their catalog. The prop guillotine has a blade which actually falls, but has stops in the groove which arrests it before it can actually hit the initiate's neck. Goodness gracious. 
Um, and the fountain of joy on the right is a punch bowl into which you, you send a rube in bare feet to dip a metal cup into the punch bowl, thus completing a circuit and getting a shock. <laughs> so these items will give you a feeling for the hundreds of others offered in these firm's mail order catalogs, including collapsing thrones, fake branding irons, target rifles that squirt one in the eye, and on and on and on. And again, if you go to the Mar um, recently Google has put the U.S. Patent Office's records online, and, and inventors were inventing these things and patenting them and, make, and protecting their intellectual rights to these initiation devices. Uh, and in Greenville, Illinois, there's now the DeMoulin Brothers Museum where they're collecting these things, and you can go see them if you want to. So looking through the pages of these catalogs, you can practically hear the laughter of America's aspiring professional class echoing down through the years. The most prominent order of the early 20th century that bought into this joking, of course, were the Shriners. Founded in the Chelsea neighborhood of New York City in 1872, the ancient Arabic order of nobles of the mystic shrine prided itself as being the playground of Freemasonry and spread to national prominence in the decade right before the First World War and the shrine's trademark Turkish fez and Arabic motifs were visual signals that the members were no longer constrained by the Judeo-Christian morality and respectability of their fathers and grandfathers. By pretending to be Arabs and playing jokes on each other, they used fraternalism as a space in which they could create a new 20th century masculinity, focused not on gentility and restraint, but upon physical toughness, demeanor, and humor men who could learn to control themselves when thrown from a mechanical goat or given an unexpected electrical shock might also have the wherewithal to thrive within the expanding white collar environment of American corporate capitalism. And in this picture, I love the fact, uh, this is from the Mecca Temple newsletter, I love the fact that the wheeled goat has been enhanced with spikes on the saddle. So riding, is, riding a goat is no longer funny enough. Now you need to ride on a goat that's got spikes on the saddle, too. So in conclusion, then, I hope today that I have demonstrated that all fraternal objects are not interchangeable. But I've also provided some tools for placing objects into temporal and functional context to show how fraternalism has changed over that 200-year 200 period, 200 period I talked about. Although an 18th century fraternal ritual painting, a 19th century ornamented lodge room, and a 20th century squirting altar can all be described as fraternal, they each have distinct stories to tell us about how mystic orders and secret societies fit into American history. Placed into context and read correctly, these items speak to us about central existential issues of being human including how to view relationships with one's peers, how to situate oneself to those who came before, and also how to manage life's vicissitudes. Thank you very much for your attention.